you may just get what you have asked for. <laughs> that's, kind of the, that's the title of this morning's message. You may just get what you, have, what you asked for. And I, I want to acknowledge we have a new, new faces here. We appreciate you guys uh, for coming. Thank you so much. And uh, his village folks, can you say hello to them? We've got the Nicholson family. We have extra folks over here today. And uh, Miss Karen over there too. We say hello to your family. Uh, I failed to meet uh, the wonderful man with a lovely baby. Uh, we thank you all for coming. Um, so we, we're we going to jump uh, in. Uh, before I start, I want to say thank you for praying. Uh, we had, uh, let's get backtrack a little, a couple of pictures. Generally, I don't like to, but I want to say thank you because last Thursday, this is my second time after two years, I was invited to the Capitol in Richmond to go offer a prayer. And I, I remember calling my wife, being very nervous, going up there, within, and just say, hey, and then please pray. I said, tell people to pray for a little bit, because uh, I was going by myself. The last time I went there, I had a whole army with me, he said, uh, Mosses, my whole family. So there's a lot of people to distract me from being in the space and get too nervous. This time I was just all by myself up there. I said, oh, God, I need your extra hand over here. So God held my hand very, very well. And in the next picture, uh, I was able to um, m- uh, have a moment with uh, um, our wonderful Lieutenant Governor. I'll tell you... Uh, Monsieur, in that moment, um, I, I will never want to forget that second when she held my hand and put her hand on top, almost like she was speaking wisdom into my life. She's just a sweet, sweet, sweet lady. So thank you guys so much for praying, for covering uh, me and so I could stand up there and to represent God. And I hope and pray that the Lord was pleased with, um, uh, with Thursday up in Richmond. So let's continue to pray for our nations. Come on, continue to pray for our nation, okay? Let's not give up. Um, It may not look like it, but God is working. God is working. I really, really believe that. For them to be so open to let us pray, and um, and when I walked there, the lady was helping me, kind of uh, organizing the whole thing. It was like... um, she remembered me, of course, and she was like, people are, they were so glad to see you. I get to a couple of faces, people remember my name or something like that. But I'm pleased, more pleased, those three kids, three young folks um, that were sitting next to me, um, the, they go up there and serve as the, um, they, call them, they call them the senator's pages. They go up there and serve for the entirety of the session. It's like 60 days or something like that. So those kids commit their lives to serving the nations. Three of them were just so sweet and kind. And um, she's the one who took one of them, the one took that picture. Uh, very kind. Um, and I asked them, I said, what did you learn? Because this, this week is the last week they're going to finish the session. So what did you learn? They said, I realized that when you see the politicians on a screen, you, you, you think they hate each other. I say, here, they love, chat, have coffee together, have lunch together. Wow. We hate each other here based upon what you see on TV. Amen? It's not in my, it's not in my sermon yet, but anyway. I, I, I feel like I just share that with us. We will hate each other based upon what the news will tell you, which is not true at all. When they are behind in those walls, they are laughing, they are talking, they are going to dinner. Miss Casey here worked with um, Senator Reeves' office. They they go to coffee. They, They enjoy each other's company. They will discuss, they will argue, but they're not enemies. So why? On this side, we are enemies. I want you just to answer that for yourself. I'm praying that we here at His Village, at least in our community, we're not going to be enemies of anybody. We're going to love each other regardless which political spectrum you are on. But we're just going to love each other. 
Can I hear an amen this morning? Amen. Yes, let's, 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 uh, let's go there. Now, one of the, um, the um, I was struggling. I wanted to come up with a very eloquent, kind of smart um, type of title. I was like, no, you're just going to get what you ask for. I think it's just simple, direct to the point, because that's exactly what the topic of this particular passage. 1 Samuel chapter 8 is a transitional chapter where we now go, we're going from the era of judges now entering to kingship and as appointing the first king that we, we will soon realize was not the right person for the job. So Samuel, as was navigating into this particular space, and we realized that God called him to be the judge. And if you go back a little bit, just um, to give um, a background for those of you guys who are here for the first time, we are going through characters of the Bible. So we're picking uh, people, we're studying people, and we want to learn from them. We want to identify ourselves with them. So this may not be a doctrinal sermon, no, a sermon that kind of um, emphasizes on on, uh, on things such as uh, biblical understanding and all that, but it's more for us to relate with these Bible characters. That's the whole purpose of this. Sometimes it's important to just find ourselves in the shoes or maybe they can, we, can, we can see that we are not different than them. If they can do it, we can also do it, good or bad as well. So if you look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7, there was some kind of revival that took place uh, Samuel was ministering um, strongly. There was uh, Israel was uh, having victory. Samuel was traveling from one city to another to preach the gospel and convicting people. So he was judging the people and encouraging the people at the same time. Life was great. Things were happening. But at the same time, Samuel's home, he had two boys, and the boys that he raised they were also, you know, just like Eli, these boys they were not walking with the Lord. As a side point, you have to realize that um, don't be too hard on ministers when their kids are not working with God. Don't look at them as failures because kids also have their own choices. They, make their, they have choices and decisions that they made. Samuel had victories. Samuel had a lot of wins, and as often in the a, in a, in a, in a Bible, we see when there was victory, they, 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 they build a memorial, they will have some kind of things to memorialize what, they, um, what God has done, what, um, uh, what, how God has saved them. And if you go to uh, Samuel chapter 1 verse 7, you will see Samuel then made, uh, t- took this large stone and, and set it up uh, to Mount P- Pisa and call it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. What he was saying, I remember God who helped us. From time to time, it's important for us to memorize, to have something in your house, whatever. You say, hey, you're not worshiping that as an idol, but you have something that become a memory to remind you of what God has done. So when you have some victories, some win in your life, please make a point and say, look what the Lord has done. Because we do forget, amen? Anybody? We do forget. If God has done something, we will forget, and then we jump to a next. But I want to encourage us to have a little, it's not, you are, you're not worshiping the rock, but you're using it as a point of reference, an object that will remind you of what God did so they were having revival in chapter 7 things were going very very well how many of you guys want to see revival in our country yes we all want to see revival okay this is what i would do let me just let me just let me just ask you to do this for me can you please stand up just where you are no just stand up a little exercise I didn't come up with this, but I've heard from um, a preacher, some of the revivalists of old, of ancient times, and one of which I believe, um, if I can just get his name, uh, Rodney Smith, Rodney Smith, 1860. 
answer this question if you want revival to happen. It was uh, in England. So if you want to see revival to hap uh, happening in your community, in your nation, what do you do? And he asked the people, he said, stand where you are and draw a circle around, just around you. So do an imaginary circle around you, just like this. So you have a little tiny circle right there, tiny. And he said, you make a decision, anybody in that circle you drew, to be revived first. Anybody in that circle to get revival. Because once that person is revived and get the revival, then the nation will get the revival. You get the point. So revival starts with you and me. So if my heart is not revived, I cannot just wish, please, you, you may be seated. Thank you very much. I cannot just wish for revival to happen. But revival start here. It start with me. And how does it uh, start? Revival start with uh, surrender and submission to God through prayer, prayer and prayer and prayer. We have to be a people, a, a, a community that is turned to prayer, that is committed to, to the worship of God. That's where revival starts, the person in the circle. So that was happening in 1 Samuel chapter 7. God was working, things were happening. And then comes 1 Samuel chapter 8. Sam, Mr. Samuel here was old. He had his sons appointed as judges in the far, far out community for, for them to, to kind of help him govern. And the Bible tells us that his, his sons were not walking in his footsteps. They were not following the God of Samuel. And finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah and discussed the matter with Samuel. Okay, Mr. Samuel, let's have a meeting. Do we have an issue here? Okay, what's, what seems to be a problem? Maybe Samuel asked a question. I, I don't think these guys, they had any kind of mercy at all. They say, you are just old. Let's just get it straight. You are old. I don't think anybody wants to take that. Sam, you are old, you've aged, I think, um, and, and, and not only they say you're old, and you, by the way, you are old and your family's messed up. Thank you, deacons, elders, appreciate that for that comment. Um, I feel so good right now, right, Samuel, I'm sure, was like, I feel so good. Uh, did you guys forget how, how awesome I was? Uh, I, we just had a revival just a few months back, Amen. But now, you are going to treat me as an old man, down and over with. By the way, the committee meetings, these are awesome committee meetings um, that people like to have in churches. But anyhow, so Samuel is sitting there. They say, you are older. And by the way, your kids are not doing what they're supposed to do. But they had a valid point to their credit. Because judges were passed on from family. From family, it stayed within the family. So they were concerned. Their concern was legitimate. You are old not as an insult. You are old because your clock is ticking, Samuel. You're going to die. So when, if and when you die, who's going to take over? Your kids? I don't think so. So their point was valid. Their concern was legitimate for them to look at it and say, we, it looked like we will have bad, bad, bad judges after this one. Because, Samuel, you are good to us. You've been great. So they were not insulting him as I was trying to make light of it. They were being very genuine and very concerned about the well-being of the Israelites in that terms. If you think about it, they wanted to make sure that whoever's going to be the successor will be a person who's going to carry on the mantle, the torch, as Samuel did. So they're having this meeting. Samuel's heart was disheartened, was hurt. Because the people say, give us a king. I start thinking about this. The people wanted to have a visible, tangible king. 
The Israelites wanted someone to govern over them. Tangible, something we can see, touch. Someone who's there physically to rule over us. We are in democratic kind of government style here in America. You have a choice, you want something, you vote, you choose, you don't want, what have you. Some of us, we have democracy even in our homes. The kids have democracy too. They choose whatever they want to do. But in reality, we were not designed, God's design was not for a democratic kind of system to, to rule and reign over us. Guess what it was? Theocratic. Theocratic. Let me give us a definition of that. A theocracy is a form of government in which God is the supreme, supreme ruler. That's theocracy. Democracy and people have the power. People choose. We, the people, in democracy. Monarchy, we have a king, a, 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 a natural king sitting just like you go to England. They have that. God is designed from the beginning of time is for him to be the supreme ruler of everyone's heart, for every one of us to bow to him and to him directly. The Israelites, when they were leaving, when God um, raised up Moses to get him out of Egypt, they didn't have a king. Moses was not the king. Moses was a prophet. When they did not have a king, God was able to deliver them from slavery. Without a king, God was able to feed them. Without a king, God was able to quench the thirst. Without a king, God was able to take them to a promised land. Without a king, with only God being the one who is guiding them, God being the one they submitting to him. When they did not have a king, God was their deliverer. When they did not have a king, God was their protector. When they did not have a king, God was their provider. And I find most of us, sir, we have a tendency to forget because we all in that kind of mindset as these uh, wonderful Israelites, we want something that is tangible. We will say, oh, I walk by faith and not by sight. Is that true? Are we truly walking by faith and not by sight? In Hebrews 1.11, now faith is a substance, the assurance of things hopeful, the evidence of things not seen. Most of us, we want to make sure that it's in the mail before I start rejoicing. I'm sure when you get, uh, when you order your, your, your stuff from, uh, from Amazon, oh, you, um, my, my kids are so famous. Rhea is spe specifically, she's so famous at getting my wife's phone. And if, uh, we, if she orders something for her, she'll be waiting and waiting and, uh, to get that notification. Ding, it's on the way. Because she knows now this thing is coming. Now she's excited, even though our faith starts when we know it's on the way. But our faith does not start before. Can I hear an amen this morning? Because uh, faith, uh, when we say uh, um, um, uh, we walk by faith, we were not by sight, uh, we're believing before we received. Most of us, is we will believe when we know it's for sure coming. Then we have the, the, the excitement, the joy. Oh, my, um, I find I've had a few doctor's appointments and things that we didn't know for sure. When we don't know, we, we all, all of us get a little anxious. I don't know for sure. Okay, I don't know this test, how it's going to happen. I can guarantee you when I get the test and read it fine, then I get, ex then I get excited. Oh, my gosh, it's awesome. Everything is fine. But there was a sense of concern when you're taking the test because you don't know the result. But the Lord is encouraging us. He said, rejoice in every city worship. Count it all joy when you go through challenges of life. Meaning we need to be able to rejoice no matter what. But most of us, our tendency is to filter to the natural first. I want to I wanna see before I get excited. 
I walked past uh, Miss Gwen just today, going back, I say, hey, how's your knee? And she said, I just believe it's already healed. Having the mind of uh, the eyes of God to say, I'm, no matter, even though I don't feel the healing today, I don't feel the restoration today, I don't feel things that have been put back together, my marriage is not stable yet, my kids are not back to God, even though I don't see it, but I'm, gonna, I'm still going to believe it as though it's already been done. So this, these folks, this, they wanted to have some kind of tangible. They say, we want to have a king. Give us a king. Samuel, your days are numbered. Your clock is ticking. Give us a king. And they want to understand that. Most of us, we don't see the immediate and when we don't see the immediate, we quit very quickly. When something does not just happen, we have a tendency to quit. There are only few patient people, literally only few people that are very patient. Uh, the only people that are patient are not the one that goes to McDonald's, are the one that goes to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> literally. Because if you go to a Chick-fil-A line, you must be a patient guy because you will wait. My McDonald's people, they honk the horn, they're mad, they hurry up because just give me that, you know, Big Mac, I want to go. But the Chick-fil-A folks, those guys will wait and wait to get their little Chick-fil-A something. I bless your heart. So next time I want to get myself a dose of, of patience, I just go sit in the Chick-fil-A line. Um, maybe I'll have a little bit more in me. But we don't like to wait. Waiting, when we start waiting, we, we, it's almost like it's not coming and we end up giving up. We don't know. What if, if you just waited one more day? What if, if you just made one more lap around the circle? What if, if you just gone one more step? What if? Just what if? I don't know. But one thing I know for sure is don't give up unless God said Give it up. They wanted a king. They wanted a kingdom to be of this earth. They say, Samuel, give us a king. Samuel was displeased. I could feel Samuel's burden. I could relate to Samuel a little bit here. It's like, I know what's best for you. I'm trying to tell you what you are looking for is not good. I could, I could just sense what Samuel was trying to echo to these guys. What you are wanting is not good. I know what's best for you. They pound on him. They pound on him. In his frustration, he went to God as a man of prayer. Have a discussion with God. God has a much, God had a much better plan for them. Anyway, let, let me just make a point here. Just because this particular king did not function or operate, that's uh, the way God was designing in the first place. I want to bring you back, if you get a chance, just uh, maybe you can write this down, uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, or you can turn there. I just want to show you that God's idea was to bring a king at some point, but this particular king was like 10 years, a little bit early. In Genesis 49, verse 10, huh? I'm just going to grab that, that little passage, but there's a much broader context on that. Huh? But in Genesis 49, verse 10, says, read, or read this, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's, um, the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. The scepter is what the, the king used to rule with. So which tribe was the tribe of Judah? But I want to also connect here, Deuteronomy verse 17, 15, and 18. I'm going to read this. You may indeed set a king. God was talking to Moses. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord will choose. Which king? The one God will choose for you. Not the one you desire for yourself. The one God will choose for you. Saul, number one. King Saul was number one. Wrong timing. 
10 years too early. Wrong tribe. King Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin, but the king that God said will come from the tribe of whom? Judah. Wrong timing, wrong tribe, and wrong terms. Let me read the terms that, um, that, that they had. And I'm telling you, this kind of blow my mind. So Samuel passed on to the Lord's the warning. God said, I want you to give these guys the warning. They want a king. This is what this king will do. Let me just tell you what you're going to get out of this deal. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your son and assign them to his chariot and, chariot and, and make them run before the chariot. Some will be generals and captain and captains of the army. Some will be forced to plow in his field and harvest crops. Some will make his weapons and chariots um, and, and chariot and equipment. The king will take your daughters from you, force them to cook, bake, and make perfume for him. Isn't that a lovely warning? You want a king? This is what the king will do for you. He will take your boys, uh, shove them into military work, uh, force them to do work that they don't want to do. Maybe your child wants to be an MBA star, but say, no, no, you got to go and be a military person over here. So nobody has a choice. Your daughters are going to work for me. They're going to come and be slaves pretty much. They're going to work for me. That's the king they want. Not only he will do that, he will take away the best of your fields, the vineyards, olive groves. Give, um, give them to his own officials. He will take the tenth of your money. So he's not going to stop there. Not only is he going to disrupt your family, the king you want will also take your money, your resources. If you guys are thinking like me right now, I'm sure you see this king already around you right now, isn't it? What are the, what are the, thing, what is, what is the thing that is taking your kids away, messing up your family already? And most of us, we don't, we don't think um, uh, these, the Israelites, they already had commitment to the priest, by the way, just in case you didn't, if you didn't know that. They had commitment to the church, the governing body from the, to, to the priest. They would give their tents to the, to, to the priest. They would still give their offering. So now imagine, think with me for a second. They would give this to the temple, to the priest, tenth of everything. Sacrifice their families to go to, to, to the work of God, to advance the kingdom of God, quote-unquote. But on the side, now you, you want an earthly king who's going to do the same thing, but this one will take everything you have, disrupt your family, and also want a tenth from you. So you're going to pay God, and you're going to pay government at the same time. That becomes 20% coming out of your paycheck. You know how many government employees? I don't even know. I'm, I'm, I don't know the, uh, the, the number, but it's, we, we, we're looking at millions of government employees out there, all over the world, scattered everywhere. Our taxes that we're paying is going to, to take care of that massive organization out there. But some of us, we even find difficulties to take care of the government of God. Because we cannot even want to, we, we don't want, here we say, God, there's no, there's no consequence. Just, can you skip and don't pay your taxes? Let's see what's going to happen. Just fail to pay your taxes several years. They're going to come after you. You think, do you think IRS will forget? No, they remember. Ten years ago, you owe this money. I know people, there, were, there, were, there was a minister who was sharing one time. Literally, he didn't pay some of the taxes. And literally, they were almost going to lock him up. Ten years later, discovered he didn't pay his taxes. They came after him. And he had to pay it up ten years later. This is the IRS. But which government is more powerful? Which government has more authority? Which government is first? 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come. Which kingdom are we talking about? His kingdom. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are trusting for God's kingdom to come here on earth, for God's will to happen here on earth. Ladies and gentlemen, we are more willing to obey, which by the way we should, obey the government here than we, we, we are to obey the kingdom of God in heaven. Wrong timing. We must trust God's timing. We must seek to be within God's timing. Don't rush and don't hold. If God say go, go. If God say do, do. If God say don't go, wait. We just don't go. If this is not the right time for you to do this, just wait. Let learn to be patient. Wrong tribe, we know, is wrong people. It wasn't the, the, the way God will, 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 will bring out the king at all. God already had a design. He spoke this from the beginning of time. He will eventually give us a king, but it won't be the king that we envision or the Israelites even envision themselves. In Hosea 13, verse 11, the Bible said, I gave you a king in my anger. God was not pleased when he was doing that. I gave you the king because I was frustrated. Just in case some of us, we think that like God is always love, 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 and Valentine's Day every day, all day. Some days God gets frustrated. In his anger, he said, I'm going to give you what you want. But there is one person who was very careful, and, and I love his, uh, his heart, Gideon. Most of us, we love the story of Gideon because he went from the way he scaled down his uh, troops to end up winning the battle with 300 men. After his victory, almost similar to what um, uh, Samuel, but after his victory, his climax, look what the people went to Gideon and asked for a request. In Judges chapter 8, Verse 22 and 23, they went to him and said, rule over us. In 23, he responded, I will not rule over you. My sons will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over us. Every time we see someone having some success, don't we all want to make him a leader? Oh, he's doing so well. Let, let, we, we always want to pick leaders, people who are talented, people who are on top. I'm going to give you a quick um, story. My, my soccer team, I picked one of my captains. He's not, he's not the best soccer player. I picked him because he had a, he's, this boy has a heart. Not the best soccer player. Not the fastest. But most of us, we will look at, oh, you're very talented, you're the fastest, you're good. Whoever was good in the field, we expect them to be the leader. And when I appoint them, and here it looks like Gideon was having success. He came back home with a victory. We won. We are the champion. Oh, Gideon, sis, can you be our king since you had a victory here? And Gideon was very smart and exercised wisdom. And he said, oh, no, I don't want you to look up to me to lead you. I want you to look up to God. We have done that with ministers. We look at them. Oh, he's, pretty, he's a, such a powerful minister. He's got an amazing ministry. Let's make him this. We started idolizing people instead of elevating God. So Gideon was smart enough to say, no, you guys need to be ruled. I say, y'all, oh my goodness, what's wrong with me? Um, <clears throat> let, me, let, me let me go back to Africa. Okay. Um, <laughs> You, much better, you need to be the king on us and, uh, over us. And he said, no, I will not rule over you. Samuel stood and said, I'm going to give you what you were looking for. Even after the warning that was given to them, how much they're going to be in bondage to this particular king, they still did not want to say, we don't want that. We would rather get ruled by God who 
we are submit our lives to God. But they wanted something tangible, something where they can, they can touch. For us this morning, I want us to remember that the government of this earth is a government that is not designed to help us be successful. It's necessary to help us do what we need to do. But the government that is designed for us to be successful is the government of God. Matthew 6, verse, verse 33 but seek first the kingdom of God. We need to have that desire to chase after the kingdom of God. And it's righteousness and all will come following. When we seek the kingdom of God first, John the Baptist came to announce what the, the kingdom of God is at hand. We know we must repent. Christ was coming to, to, to instill, to, 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 uh, to set up a new way of governing. He said he, was, he came to instill the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is not consist of just futility, but it consists of power. It's, it's all about the authority of God in it. I, I like the, the right, the... The psalmist who wrote, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. So the kingdom of God is not just one that will last a season, but it's one that is eternal. It's one that when God puts Adam and Eve in, I say, I give you dominion, I give you rulership, I give you the authority to oversee, manage everything in here. They had the kingdom of God in their hands to govern the entire space. The thing that robs us, ladies and gentlemen, is when we allow self to take center stage. When it's all become about me, which was uh, the issue with King Saul. In fact, uh, when, Christ, uh, when God revealed this to Samuel and said, we want you to go tell the Israelites what, they what they're going to be getting because Samuel will be just all about himself. Once we make things all about us, we lose that focus because the kingdom of God is him first and then he expanded this way. In Matthew 10, verse 7 and 8, and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What are we going to do in that? We need to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. We need to do the work of God. Therefore, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That is Hebrews 12, verse 28. Let us be grateful. How do we receive that? Through Jesus Christ. Through, if you have Christ as your Lord and Savior, you receive his kingdom on the inside of you. Therefore, let us be grateful to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The government of this earth can turn and change. But God's government will never change. Remain the same yesterday today and forever. As I'm wrapping up, Ms. Ms. Octavia, can you just play a little bit for us in the back, ma'am? As I'm wrapping up to, uh, this, after, this afternoon, this morning, I would say, which kingdom, who do you want to rule over your life? Who has rulership over your life? Who has dominion? Who have you surrendered your life to? Are you, more, are you more concerned about how you appear in this kingdom? And guess what their prayers was? I'm going to read this part. It's very powerful. In verse 19 of 1 Samuel chapter 8. But the people refused to listen to whom? To Samuel. Even so, we still want 
a king, they said. We want to be like every other nation. <laughs> we all want to be like everybody else around us, don't we? I don't want this warning that you're giving me. I would rather look like, uh, feel like. I want to be associated. I don't want to be single. I, 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 I don't want to be the odd man or woman out. Because uh, of, the, of wanting to be like everybody else, we are willing to compromise. Amen? Willing to compromise. They were not designed to be like everybody else. Don't you know that you are not designed to be like everyone else? Uniquely made, created in his own image for his purpose. You are not designed to be like everybody else. But when we get up in the morning, oh man, oh man, my, my neighbor's having that kind of car. Oh, my neighbor painted the shadows blue. Oh my, we all want to be like everybody else. So what if you have this kind of call, this kind of harm, this kind of, I don't care I, I, if I don't have that, but I have God in me. I don't have to compromise anything to be like everybody else. I don't have to dress like anybody else. I don't have to talk like anybody else. I am me, Eric Kalinga. Created in God's image for my purpose. I have to stick to my assignment. So you are created in his own image, in his likeness. Stick to what God has called you. We were not created to be dependent upon this government. For any of us thinking that this government will answer your problem, it doesn't matter who is in the White House, Green House, or Pink House. It doesn't matter who is in that house. No one can satisfy nor answer the, the human problem other than God. Other than God. 